This is a really good one. What does a day off for you consist of? Does your me time consist of builds off camera? Yes. Uh, do your days off consist of putting things down and walking away from the shop? Yeah, most definitely. Um, it's funny. I have get I have a, a get shit done itis. I have a pathology that if I'm not actively getting something done, I feel like I'm wasting my time, and I feel a little guilty about it. Uh, and that is difficult to be my partner. <laughs> uh, it's funny because we had dinner with some friends on. We had some dinner with we had dinner with some friends on Sunday night, and they asked, um, "How was your weekend?" And I was saying, "I didn't do very much work at all this weekend." And my wife looked over at me, and she's like, "Did you really not do a lot of work this weekend?" And it is a fuzzy line because part of my relaxation might be going and doing image searches of stuff, uh, just to kind of like, "Oh, I need more images of this kind of spacesuit." Oh, I want to look at more Mobius imagery. That's definitely stuff I do on the weekends. But I don't think of that as work because it is such a pleasure. But like, that's just part of moving around the house and, okay, let me start from the beginning. On the weekends, I tend to stay home. I mostly don't come into the cave and I mostly don't get much done. I mean, I'll trim the, the, the I'll trim some of the plant matter we have in and around and outside our house. I will do house maintenance stuff. Uh, I will, uh, you know, take the dog to the park. But I really, I have been working hard this year on using my weekends for nothing. Because I recognize that when I do that, by Sunday night, I do feel very relaxed and Mondays. And I work, I mean, I, I work a regular work week. I come in here Monday around 10 a.m. and I, you know, work every day until Friday around 4 or 5. Uh, and because of that, yeah, the vacate, literally vacating my, my, my work problems on the weekend is a, a really useful thing. Um, and like I said, I still always feel a little guilty about it. I really, seriously, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to shake. Um, but I like, uh, I also like taking care of the house and, you know, housework, it's, uh, it's a different kind of satisfaction for get shit done itis. It, it definitely is. And so that is definitely relegated to the weekends. I try not to drive anywhere on the weekends because San Francisco Bay Area traffic is back to just genuinely terrible. Um, don't get me wrong, during Burning Man, oh, so awesome. But that is a rare, that is a rare thing. Labor Day weekend, one of the best weekends to be in San Francisco. Um, There were some questions uh, about ILM. Yes, yes. Uh, Thomas Essen, at ILM, what happened to mold master patterns and vacuum form bucks following their use? Master patterns and bucks rarely surface in auctions, so I wonder if prop slash model shops tend to scrap them, repurpose them, or hold on to them. I can tell you that ILM has a phenomenal collection of uh, vacuum form bucks that are in the archives or hanging on the walls at the Letterman complex. For Daylight, I think it was the movie Daylight, a Sylvester Stallone tunnel thriller, uh, ILM did this big shot of a whole bunch of cars in an underground tunnel being filled with water, I think, and they manufactured a whole bunch of cars. And Ira Keeler, who I worked with when I was at ILM, just a legendary sculptor. And that guy, that guy, <laughs> Ira Keeler. So Ira Keeler would sit here and with a giant, with big laminated chunks of basswood and a, and a specifically one of these, these little craftsman finger sanders. And Ira had this whole protocol he walked me through of how he flattened that and sharpened that and adjusted this to give a little better feel and soften the edges. And he would just sit there and 
make the, I mean, these bucks are so gorgeous. There's one of a Citroen, the, uh, the, 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 the one with four wheel independent hydraulic suspension that looks like a spaceship from like 68. I can never remember the name and it's one of my all time favorite car shapes in the world. Uh, and Ira Keeler did a beautiful basswood buck of that. He also did a three part wooden buck of stormtrooper helmets, which I remember being pulled when I was first in the model shop in 98, before it moved across Kerner, back across Kerner Boulevard. Um, and those are in the archives. They're never gonna show up. Other vacuum form bucks that were like, you know, someone cast a car in plaster or a piece of a big thing, those, those tended to get tossed, but the, the big beautiful stuff, that, they, they hold on to that. That's why it hasn't shown up. Uh, and then there's another question here. Larry Nixon says, when ILM closed their model shop and embraced CGI, what effect did that have on the model industry? Well, so that moment occurred, when did ILM get rid of their model shop finally? It's like 05, 06, give or take around there. Might've been a little earlier. Uh, it might've been a little earlier, not sure, but it wasn't, uh, from what I understood, the reason they got rid of the model shop was because it's very expensive on a per person, per square footage basis to maintain a model shop. Um, it is a high cost for the producing team, uh, whereas the CG desk is a much lower cost. Um, but it wasn't like ILM was embracing CG entirely in the, I guess the question includes this assumption that there was a choice being made. And I think it was more of a financial choice than a choice about how special effects should get done. There's a difference there. Producer wants it done cheaper, but ILM has always been committed to the right solution. Uh, and sometimes they don't get to implement it because for whatever reason, the job or the, or the director or the, you know, whatever vagaries of reality inhibit, you know, the artisans at ILM from, from executing the perfect special effect. They're always trying. They always want that. Um, and so uh, the model shop world here in the Bay Area was deteriorating for years before that. Back when I first moved here in 1990, there was like, there was so much going on. There was Skeleton working on a Nightmare and then James and the Giant Peach. And there was CWI working on The Fly and Arachnophobia. Uh, that was Chris Wayless up there. Uh, there was uh, all the Fry's Electronics props were being built in a giant warehouse off of 3rd Street. Uh, M5 was going. And there was, yeah, there was a couple of other smaller model shops doing stuff for commercials. And I, you know, there was a lot of places to work. And then by the late 90s, there was like, Chris Wallace had uh, gotten rid of CWI. Uh, a lot of the smaller shops had shut down and ILM was one of the last ones up here. Um, so, you know, my friends who are model makers, a lot of them transitioned to CG uh, and ILM paid for that. They like paid to train these guys, which was really smart of them because you know, a model maker has spent a long time being sensitized to getting a good narrative out of a surface, out of a piece. Uh, and that is a directly translatable skill between the physical world and, and CG. I mean, my friend Dave Fogler said to me after a couple of years of doing it, and he's like, you know, I feel the same satisfaction building a really complicated and beautiful CG model that works as I did when I did it physically. And he's like, I feel the same endorphin rush. Um, I feel like things are moving back towards models a little bit. I, I just, my sense is, is that like people like uh, Frank Ippolito and Legacy FX and Spectral Motion are a little busier is what I kind of feel like. Uh, and I think that some of that is because there's tons of Star Wars television going on. There's a lot of stuff to build. That's really exciting. Um, but I gotta tell you, you know, getting into Industrial Light and Magic in 98 and working there through 03, I really did feel like I was like, the door is closing and I'm like coming through and pulling my hat at the last second. I can't believe I was able to work there at the end of that era because, uh, you know, since then, the only place that feels like it matches the scope and scale and ambition of ILM is Weta. Uh, and it really does. And going to Weta feels so much like ILM in the old days, totally even down to the craftsman offices, uh, the craftsman style offices.
Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support us even further, you can by becoming a tested member. Uh, details are, of course, below, but it includes all sorts of perks and we're building them all the time. You get advanced word and behind the scenes photos of some of our projects questions, you get to ask direct questions during my live streams, and we have some members-only videos, including the Adam real-time series of unbroken, unedited shots of me working here in the shop. They are weirdly meditative. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you on the next one.